Welcome to the Influenza webinar series hosted by the Human Vaccines Project. The Human Vaccines Project is a nonprofit public private partnership with the goal of decoding the human immune system to accelerate the development of vaccines and immunotherapies. In order to make real progress toward the development of a universal influenza vaccine, collaboration among researchers around the world is essential. We hope this monthly webinar will foster the scientific foundation needed to advance influenza research. This series of webinars will be broadcast on the third Tuesday of each month and posted online. For a copy of today's webinar, please visit the Human Vaccines Project website at www.humanvaccinesproject.org backslash talks. Following the presentation, we will have time for questions from the audience. Please type your questions into the questions box in the GoTo interface. I will read these questions following the presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Helder Nakaya. Dr. Nakaya is an assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Analyses and Toxicology at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and an adjunct professor in the Department of Pathology at Emory School of Medicine. He is an expert in systems vaccinology, an interdisciplinary field which combines system-wide measurements, networks, and predictive modeling in the context of vaccines and infectious disease. Dr. Nakaya's laboratory applies computational systems biology approaches to understand and predict the mechanisms of vaccines induced, vaccines induced immunity for yellow fever, seasonal influenza, meningococcal, and tularemia vaccines. Today, Dr. Nakaya will tell us about unraveling the mechanism of influenza vaccine induced immunity through systems vaccinology. Go ahead, Dr. Nakaya. Thank you so much, Jillian. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about systems vaccinology, and I will show some published data from the, the beginning when I started working with this, and also some uh, unpublished data that we have been doing here in the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So before I start the, the, the presentation, I would like to show a little bit of, the, of what our laboratory does, and I like to, to show by using the, the logo of the lab. So. Uh, the, the laboratory is all dry. So there, there are only computers, no bench, no centrifuge, no freezers. So this motherboard here represents what we do with the computers. And we also work a lot with systems. So we analyze complex systems as, as networks, so gene regulatory networks, metabolites. But what really interests us, what is behind all this is the biology. So uh, this laboratory is a computational system biology laboratory where we use bioinformatics to try to study and understand more uh, diseases, infectious diseases such as chikungunya, dengue, Zika, yellow fever, and also several vaccines that are relevant for countries like Brazil, for example. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about this, but this is just to show that uh, we have been using bioinformatics and systems biology to, to understand why chikungunya in, in infection uh, cause arthritis or the why Zika could cause uh, microcephaly. So this is the data from brain of babies that die with Zika and microcephaly. But I would like to focus on, on the vaccinology part. And, uh, and as you all know, biology moved from cellular to molecular a few decades ago. And what happens that in this past 25, 20 years, there were major revolutions in robotics, nanotechnology, computers, internet, lasers. And uh, if you take, for example, the human genome sequencing, it took us 14 years and $2.7 billion to accomplish. And now we can do it in less than four days for uh, around $1,000. So mo the molecular biology now went to the high throughput biology. So everyone is doing omics now, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And uh, if you take, for example, immunology, if you look all the con conventional tools using immunology, which are still really useful, they have now a, an equivalent, which is more high throughput or at least almost high throughput. So for instance, what you can do with ELISA, you can could, you could now use uh, Luminex or mass spectrometry to do proteomics, metabolomics. Same thing with knockout mice that, that took years to develop, now people can do in a few months. Uh, you can measure the, ex the expression profile of all cells or, or even single cells using uh, next generation sequencing. You can assess the whole immune repertoire of someone. And also instead of 16 colors, you can use dozens of colors using Cytop, for example. And 
now we 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 seem to move to a more integrative biology, which is the systems biology part. When when you are now not looking to one layer of information, which is, for example, transcriptomics, but also different layers in trying to integrate all of this. And the consequence of all this is that uh, we have now projects such as the Precision Medicine Initiative, the Human Cell Atlas, the Earth Microbiome Projects, and it, it, it was clear that data, uh, that biology became big data science. So the data generated uh, across this uh, phase increased exponentially. And the question is, what about the knowledge? Do the knowledge also, did the knowledge also increase uh, exponentially? Sidney Brenner, he said that we are drowning in a sea of data and thirsting for knowledge. Most biology today is low input, high throughput, no output biology. So that's the, the motto of the lab because we are really afraid of just generating data without trying to give any knowledge. So what the, the summary is that data itself does not mean anything if it's not to bring knowledge and knowledge to be transformed into understanding. And what do I mean by that? So for example, if we take uh, eggs and put in a, in a boiled uh, pan, we are gonna have, we know that we are gonna have boiled egg, but how many of us understand the molecular mechanism, the molecular aspect of this, how the, the the birds eggs are born at molecular level. Same thing with vaccines. Uh, if we immunize millions of people, we know that they're gonna be protected against infectious disease. We know that this has to do with uh, antibodies, innate immunity, CD8 cell response, but uh, we really need to know more about the mechanism of vaccine-induced immunity or why people respond differently to the same vaccine. And that's how uh, I think that Systems biology can be applied to, to not only vaccinology, but also to immunology in general. Uh, if you look at the systems immunology, uh, there are like two ways of, for example, investigating the molecular mechanism of something. Imagine that you have a perturbation, in this case, uh, uh, ligand binding, and then you want to know what happens here that give you this output here. The top, at uh, the bottom up systems immunology, the bottom up uh, way is what we have been doing the, the, the several decades of immunology. So which is doing mechanistic studies, trying to understand every little piece here and then putting together here to try to understand and, and what's happening in this process here. What we do in the lab is more uh, a top-down approach, which is you start from this black box, you, you measure the whole thing, and then you try to reduce to using computational and mathematical models that, that we will be able to find places where you can test and validate later. And, and this perturbation, there is no other better perturbation uh, to study immunology than vaccines, because you know exactly when you perturb the system, the dose that you are using to perturb the system, and that's the, 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 the goal of systems vaccinology. And that's why systems vaccinology uh, is uh, an important field. When I joined Bali Polendron's lab uh, at Emory University, when I became his postdoc uh, at Emory, he has this dream of, uh, can we unravel the molecular mechanism of vaccine-induced immunity? So he, he told me that his dream was actually to later, once we do, we study several diseases and identify the signatures of each disease, we could put these signatures into a, a commercial kit or, or chip, vaccine chip, and then use this to predict vaccine-induced immunity. So you will not need to wait 30 days, or even worse, you, you will not need to wait people to get it, uh, to die from the infections to see if the vaccine worked or not. So that was the ultimate goal when I joined uh, his lab. And the principles of systems vaccinology is the same as systems biology, but applied to vaccines. So for, for instance, we use the vaccination as a perturbation of the system, and then we monitor the response at the system's level using omics technology, such as CYTOF, next generation sequencing, mass spectrometry. And then uh, this data, this big data actually, is gonna be integrated into computational and mathematical modeling that are gonna be used 
to understand and to predict the system. And with the hypothesis and it, the insights that are generated in this phase, we can think, for example, in a new perturbation of the system. We can think, for example, to in, increase the dose, uh, uh, add an adjuvant, or uh, make a heterologous vaccines, and then do it again all over. Or we can try to validate and test this hypothesis using animal models, mechanistic studies uh, with in vitro systems, and that may lead to better uh, vaccine design and development. So that's the, the, the goal of uh, systems vaccine knowledge. And that's uh, what uh, we did in 2009 in this paper led by Troy in Bali Polender's group. So we study people vaccinated with yellow fever vaccine and then measure the antibody response that happens uh, several weeks later. So you measure the expression that happens in the first seven days after vaccination, so the innate uh, response. So you measure the expression of 25,000 genes in parallel in the blood, and then you try to predict, you, you try to find genes that could predict what's gonna happen with the CD8 cell response and the antibody response several weeks later. And then uh, we found some genes that could predict, for instance, CD8 cell response. We knew that uh, if you have the expression, high expression of this gene in the early phase, in the early late response, you could predict what's happened, what's going to happen to CD8 cell response. And one of the gene was GCN2. GCN2 is a, a kinase that sends amino acid deficiency in the cell. Well, it is related to an ancient mechanism where, for example, amino acid starvation can trigger GCN2, then the metabolic stress pathway is going to phosphorylate the IF2 alpha, it's going to shut down uh, translation, and it's going to promote autophagy. And the question is how GCN2 could be related to CD8 cell response? And I don't have time to show the, the, the result. That was a beautiful study led by Rajesh and Noor that shows that the yellow fever virus could not only lead to this starvation, but also uh, activate several genes related to uh, innate immunity in dendritic cells. And that was related to antigen presentation to T cells. So that was published uh, five years later, showing that uh, an unappreciated link between virus-induced integrated stress response in dendritic cells and the adaptive immune response. So we only found this GCN2 because of this systems biology uh, paper on yellow fever. And then uh, uh, that was the link how this could be related to a higher CD8 cell response. And then Rajesh was uh, analyzing, uh, was studying this GCN2 knockout mice, and he noticed that uh, there were some problems with the, the inflammation of, of those mice. So he asked me, I was already here in, in Brazil, to check if the expression of GCN2 was also changing in a uh, disease, the chronic inflammatory disease in, in the bowels, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And then, yes, uh, we did not need to uh, start a new cohort. We just got public available data, and we showed that the GCN2 was actually change, changing in this uh, inflammatory disease compared to health controls. And that also was part of his paper that uh, he shows a lot of mouse work that shows that GCN2 also controls gut inflammation by inhibiting inflammasome uh, activation. And all this was done for the yellow fever vaccine, which is one of the best vaccines in the world. Uh, one dose can give you protection for the whole life. And you know that this is very different than influenza vaccines. Influenza vaccines, you have to be vaccinated every year, no matter how important you are. And, and, and the influenza vaccine depends on the strains, of course, that were chosen. It works relatively well for young adults, but it does not work that well for uh, elderly people. So you have to increase the dose, for example. And also does not work the same when you are, when you are vaccinating very uh, young children. And uh, my goal in Balipulander's lab was to try to understand why the same vaccine give you like different antibody response and what are the molecular signatures that are involved in this uh, different antibody responses. So all of these were published uh, before and, and I'm, I'm not gonna talk about each one of them because they are already public. 
Uh, but I want to talk about one result that was found in this first 2011 paper here, which is uh, this network here. Well, here are the genes that were uh, correlated with antibody response. So it means that if you take the expression of the genes three days or seven days after vaccination, it is correlated with the antibody response that happens 30 days after vaccination. And one of the genes that I want to bring your attention is TLR5, toll-like receptor 5. The expression of toll-like receptor 5 is, was positively correlated to antibody response against influenza uh, following vaccination. So that means that uh, if you have a higher uh, expression of TLR5 at day three, you would have higher antibody response 30 days later. But that did not make any sense, you know, uh, because the ligands of toll like receptor 5 is actually flagellin, and flagellin is a bacterial component. So why a bacterial component would be important for uh, uh, influenza vaccine? inactivate actually influenza vaccine. So uh, the first thing we, we, we tried to do was to see if toll like receptor 5 was really important for uh, influenza vaccination. And that became JSON O uh, project. So what JSON showed was if you immunize uh, wild type mice, the, the immune response to the vaccine increased to the flu inactivate vaccine. But if you immunize a toll like receptor 5 knockout mice, the, the immune response diminish here. And then the second question was, was uh, so where the ligands is coming from? We checked for contaminants in the vaccine and there was no contaminants, bacterial contaminants in the flu vaccine, for the, com the commercial flu vaccine. So where the ligand was coming from? The hypothesis is that the they, they were coming from the, the commensals in the guts. And remember that was in 2010, the, the microbiome story was not like a hype in, in, in that time. And, uh, and how do you check if the, the commensals in the guts are important, for example, for uh, influenza response? You can treat mice with antibiotics. So if you treat mice with antibiotics, the amount of bacteria in the stool decrease 26 folds. And if you buy germ-free mice, the amounts uh, increase, decrease even more. So when you decrease the amount of bacteria in the gut, you can then immunize them with flu vaccine and measure the antibody response. As you can see, the antibody response of antibiotic, antibiotics treated mice and germ-free mice were comparable to, to toll like receptor 5 meaning that uh, the TLR5 mediates sensing of gut microbiota is necessary for antibody response to seasonal influenza vaccination. Uh, and now Bali Polendron is doing uh, experiments in humans where the, he is, in, he is uh, treating humans with antibiotics and then checking what happens with the influenza vaccine response. What was clear to me like in that time is that uh, the, the, the immune response is actually composed of several different networks. We have a, a cell population network, epigenomics, transcriptomics. Each layer also talks to each other so that they connect, they, they influence each other. And when you are dealing with uh, perturbation such as infection or vaccine and measure immune response, you have to take into account not only these different networks, but also past immunizations, previous infections, family history, diet, stress, nutrition status, all this taken into account on top of the, the, the technical noise of the high throughput technologies. And uh, since then we have been uh, working with different vaccines data sets, so herpes, malaria, influenza, yellow fever, meningococcus, pneumococcus, typhoid fever, and also a lot of uh, uh, data sets, uh, a lot of studies on infection, acute infection, chikungunya, zika, dengue, chagas, sosomiasis, tuberculosis, and leishmaniasis. And what I want to show is uh, three different projects. One is published in two are not. This one was published uh, the end of last, last year. In, uh, it was about the inf inflammation induced by influenza virus impaired human innate immune control of pneumococcus. And uh, that was uh, involved Daniela Ferreira and her group in Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine that did all the, the, the experimental, the, the wet lab parts 
and we did the, the, the dry lab part. Uh, pneumonia is the leading cause of death in children under five years old. One out of six childhood deaths were due to pneumonia. And also, pneumococcal nasal colonization is the primary reservoir and the first step for the disease. Influenza infection, this is already known as well, is a major risk factor for pneumococcal pneumonia. So you, as you see, there are like a, the seasonal influenza increasing pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia increasing uh, after. So that was already known already. What is not so uh, clear is the, 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 the nasopharyngeal mucosal correlates of protection for this pneumonia or the clearance of the bacteria. So what we tried to, to address was, are there other key players uh, involved in this uh, clearance of, or even in the colonization by the bacteria? And which cytokines and genes are, genes are associated with protection? So to address this first part here, which is uh, the colonization and also the influenza infection, how influenza infection is related to pneumococcal pneumonia, uh, Daniela's group did the human challenge model. So we simulate influenza infection by using live attenuated influenza virus vaccine. So basically you use cold adapted virus that replicates in the, in the nasal mucosal as a uh, to simulate the, the, the influenza infection, and then you challenge, you inoculate streptococcus pneumonia and see if it's colonized or not. And then what we did here in Brazil was to do the analysis to try to find correlates of protections and other key players and cytokines and genes. So what Daniela did there in Liverpool was amazing because they have a, a facility that collects uh, samples before the challenge. So they collect the nasal wash, they collect bloods, they collect DNA, then they inoculate the, the bacteria, and then they collect post-challenge samples and do the culture to see who is carriage positive and who is carriage negative. And they found that around 40 to 50% colonization. And more, most important, they did this over in over 700 people, volunteers, and no serious adverse events uh, were, were found. So this is a, a, video, a short video just to show like a, they are inoculating the, the bacteria in the nose and then they, they wash and that's what we did the, the RNA-seq uh, in the analysis. And here they are showing the, the colonization. So uh, I want to, to talk a little bit about this part here, but it's uh, the design was uh, very simple. They, they, they separate the, 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 the group of volunteers into two. One received the live attenuated influenza vaccine uh, three days before the inoculation of the bacteria. So that, that, that simulates the infection with the influenza virus and then the, the, the colonization or not with the, the bacteria. And as a control group, we use the, the volunteers immunized with the TIV vaccine, the, the, the inactivated vaccine given intramuscularly. Uh, the first thing we noticed, so we collect, uh, they collect samples for uh, immunophenotyping, RNA-seq, uh, Luminex. And the first thing that was clear is that people that receive first the, the influenza vaccine, which is the, the, the influenza infection, LIV, had higher colonization carriage density, carriage density compared to the healthy controls, to the people that received the TIV. And if you look at the monocytes, if you look at the monocytes in the nasal uh, mucosa, you see that people that have, uh, that are carriage negative and receive the inactivated flu vaccines, basically the, 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 the monocytes do not go to the mucosa two days, nine days, or 29 days after uh, the colonization. And when you, when you do the, when they are colonized, the, the monocytes goes there and the peak is on day nine. But when you use the, when you infect first with the influenza virus, the monocytes seems to not go there 
at the same rates as if you do not have a, uh, the influenza. So you see that there is a, a, a lower level here as compared to, to here. And then we did the, the differential expression analysis, the network analysis, the co-expression network analysis, where we try to identify the genes and the pathways that are involved in people that, that, are, that receive the, the influenza uh, infection first and were carried positive or, or the one that are carried positive but did not receive the, were not infected with influenza first. And then we see like that the signatures are actually not the same, they, 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 they change a lot, but the, the take home results could be summarized here. So the, the, the hypothesis mechanism was that at day zero, there is no infection. Uh, and this is the control group. When you inoculate the, the bacteria, neutrophils uh, go there, degranulates, active, uh, activates, the monocytes migrate to the nose and that clear the bacteria uh, several days later post colonization. And when you infect first with the virus, the influenza virus, you trigger uh, inflammation, you increase uh, pro inflammatory cytokines, IP10, TNF, and, and the, the neutrophil function is impaired. And then when you inoculate the, the bacteria, there is an increased carriage, reduced monocyte migration to the nose, and then there is a delayed clearance because of that. Geogenes in, in our lab, uh, he's working with long known coding RNAs involved uh, in response to vaccination. So this is a, a, a manuscript under review now. And uh, it talks about long known coding RNAs. So long known coding RNAs are transcripts longer than 200, 200 nucleotides that lack significant protein coding potential. There are actually several types of long known coding RNAs. This is only one of them which has 10,000 different long, uh, long local RNAs in the human genome, but there are like several others that exist that are also long known coding. And the functions uh, as gene regulators are also diverse. As you see, like the, they can recruit proteins to, to, to do epigenetic uh, modifications on histones or DNA. They, they can serve as a sponge for microRNA they can work on alternative splicing, they can impair the, or promote transcription. And if you look at immunology, there are like several papers describing long known codings involved with uh, different immunological process. But there was no paper that systematically looked at long known coding associated with vaccine induced immunity. So that was uh, his goal. Try to see if they are there, if they are important for uh, vaccine-induced immunity. What we did was to, to, to collect the blood transcriptome data sets that are public available. So for example, we have blood from people at day zero before vaccination, and also people after vaccination, the, the blood transcriptome at day one, day three, day seven, day 14 after vaccination. And we did this, for example, for 12 different cohorts of uh, influenza uh, vaccines. So each one of these are different seasons, 2007 season, 2008 season, 2009 season, 2011. And these are the number of subjects and the time points that were collected for each one of these uh, different cohorts. And we did also uh, the same for the uh, yellow fever vaccine, where we collect hundreds of different samples for the yellow fever vaccine as well. And the first analysis that uh, we did was to find is there any differentially expressed genes that is consistently differ differentially, expressed, differentially expressed in all the, the, the cohorts. So for example, if you take a, a influenza cohort, the 12 cohort, the 11 cohorts, you don't see any gene that is uh, upregulated or downregulated in all 11 cohorts, but you do see uh, some genes, these seven genes years, that were uh, differentially expressed in 10 out of 11 cohorts. And as you can see, each line here is a uh, time point. And uh, when you treat only one data set, if you ask the gene that should be differentially expressing at least one data set, you, you see uh, thousands of genes. But when you start increasing the stringency by asking genes to be consistently differentially expressed, the number drops really quick. 
And when you do this for long known coding RNA, it's the same thing. You do see hundreds of long known codes if, if you consider only one cohort, but if you, call, if you consider several, the number decreases a lot. There is only one long known coding that were uh, differentially expressed in seven out of 11 uh, cohorts, which is this FUN38 uh, long known coding RNA. And here is the forest plot that shows the meta analysis for uh, different. Uh, four different long known coding RNAs at day one, day three, day seven. And this one is a protein coding gene, which is uh, almost a, a positive control that uh, we know that it is uh, increasing after flu vaccination at day seven. So we wanted to, to show here them uh, to show the pattern of expressions. So we do see that some genes, some long known coding are changing at day one, day three, and some are on day seven. And then we use uh, an expression atlas to show like where, uh, which immune cell type probably express these long known codes the most. For instance, if you look at this long known code here, the anti sense one, it seems to be highly expressing NKs and CD4 T cells. If you look at the, the, the positive control, the TNFRSF17, highly expressing in germinal center B cells and plasma B cells. And what I want to bring your attention is this gene here, FUN38. FUN38, FUN when you look at the expression on different cell types, we see that it is highly expressed in B cells, especially in plasma B cells, cells that secrete antibodies. And when you look at the, the location, the genomic location of FUN38, it is actually very close by to immunoglobulin genes. You see, this is the, the genome uh, region of the, the gene. And then the question is, do, do FUN38 somehow is involved in the, in the regulation of the immunoglobulin genes? How can we check if FUN38 is involved or associated with the expression of these immunoglobulin genes. We can use an approach, which is not the best one, but it's, it's called the guilt by association analysis, which is basically you correlate the expression of FUN38 in the, each one of these genes and see if they are uh, correlated. So of course, correlation is not causal, and we are doing now a uh, functional experiment to try to see if uh, FUN38 regulates actively the, these genes. But what we can see is that for different cohorts, we see a positive correlation of FUN38 and this gene. We see a positive correlation on this gene and this gene here, and also here, and also here. But when we look at this gene here, there is no positive co correlation anymore. So as it stops uh, to be correlated with this gene here. And what about the epigenetic mechanism or topological, topologically associating domains? So what about long known codes that act in trans, which is uh, regulate genes very far away in the genomic regions? So one way we can do this is using co-expression, which is you take one sample, for example, and then you measure the, the, the amounts of molecules that for the long known codes in this yellow one here, and also for this gene here, and also for this gene here. So imagine that these are the, the proportion of molecules for this gene in sample one. And then you can plot this here in this graph. And then you do the same for the sample two, for example, where you have more long known codings and less uh, of this transcript here. So that is translated like this. And then you do this for sample three and the same thing here. And when you do this for hundreds of samples, you can see the patterns that there are of some genes that are co-expressed. So that means that when the genes in this module is up, the other gene is also up. If the gene goes down, the other gene also goes down. And then we can find for long known coding RNAs that have inverse uh, correlation patterns to these co expression modules. So, in order to identify co expression modules in a very easy way and also do functionalities, we developed this tool called SEMI2, co expression model identification tool. And because uh, I want to, to, to make it available to anyone. We, we later create this web version here that allows anyone without bioinformatics background, background to run uh, modular analysis. So you can just point and click and go to this website and then you do co-expression modular analysis with any expression data sets. So the end, the, 
the results of the, this analysis, after you run co-expression analysis on 12, uh, 11 different cohorts, you end up with modules of genes, communities of genes that have similar expression patterns. So then you can look, for example, of uh, what the genes in each one of these communities are enriched. For example, you see that the, co the, the community one was enriched for monocytes. The community three is enriched for neutrophils and so forth, so on. And then you can also look for the, the activity of this community in these different time points uh, for, after flu vaccination. For example, the community one, which is enriched for monocyte related genes, they are actually upregulated or highly active on day one after vaccination. And uh, if you look at uh, the, the module community uh, seven, which is related with plasma cells and, and antibody secreting cells, it is actually uh, highly active on day seven after vaccination. And then you can look at the long known codes that are inside these modules or regulated inversely each one of these genes inside this module. And we create this website called the Vaccine Database, Vaccine DB, that allows you to explore not only influenza but also yellow fever vaccine cohorts. So all these cohorts were there in the, in the, the database. And then you can look for differential expression, uh, gene long long code RNA correlations, and also gene antibody correlation. So if you put FUM38 uh, gene here, you can look the genomic location and also the forest plots. You can see if the gene is upregulated or downregulated or positively correlated or negatively correlated with the antibody response on these different uh, time points. And we are planning to do this with more vaccines to, to expand this database. And this is the last project from uh, Patricia that works uh, with the Ebola vaccine. So this is a collaboration with the Ebola Plus Consortium, which is a European consortium that uh, has generated data on vaccine, uh, vaccinees uh, to Ebola vaccine. The Ebola vaccine is very immunogenic. It gives 100% protection. It gives you like a high antibody titers after vaccination that uh, persists for actually two years after vaccination. So it is really good in terms of uh, producing antibody uh, response. However, the vaccine is also very reactogenic. If you look at, for example, the, the side effect, the adverse event that happens after vaccination, you see that uh, myalgia chills in, in European people, also some cases of arthritis caused by the Ebola vaccination. So the, the goal was, let's try to use machine learning uh, to try to find genes that can predict adverse events. So even, even before you vaccinate someone, can you try to identify genes that can tell you if it's uh, good or not to vaccinate this person because this person may or not develop some serious adverse events. So the way we did this was taking the, 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 the vaccinees and we know that which ones are, uh, which of these vaccinees had no adverse events or they have several adverse events. In this figure, I'm showing 18, but actually there are more than 200 uh, vaccinees. And then we have the expression, for example, the blood transcriptome at baseline for each one of these uh, people here. Imagine like a table with 20,000 rows and each column is from a different person here. And the way we want to analyze this was using a machine learning algorithm called random forest. And I want to explain a little bit uh, how this algorithm works. So you understand how we, uh, we found the genes that could predict the, antibody, uh, the adverse events. So if you take, for example, the, the expression of one gene, let's say the expression of gene A, you can plot, for example, the, the expression of each one of the, the, these vaccines here in this axis, and also the people that have adverse, uh, ser several adverse events. As you can see there, there are some places where you can establish a cutoff that separates most of the people that have se several adverse events from the people that did not have adverse events. But of course, there are some people that were not supposed to be here and some people that were not supposed to be here. But then you can use another gene, for example. You put this gene here and then you can use another gene, let's say the expression of gene F, 
and then try to find another cutoff that separates most of the people here and most of the people here. And then you put the gene F here. And then you do the same for the gene K, and then you do the uh, you put it here, and yet and you keep doing this until you separate people that have several adverse events from those that have no adverse events. But the thing is, this is the decision tree. And the thing is that you don't do this. You don't create the decision tree using the entire data sets. What you do is to randomly select uh, subsets of the, the, the subjects and also randomly select the, a subset of genes. And then you do this, you create a random data set and then you create the decision tree out of this. And you repeat this, this process 1,000 times and then you have 1,000 trees at the end. And how do you call a place where you have 1,000 trees? A forest. So that's the random forest uh, algorithm. And what you can do is to count how many times the gene appeared in this tree to give you the importance of the gene in predicting the uh, adverse events. And when we do this, for example, when you try to find genes at baseline that predict having two or more adverse events, we found, for example, several genes, and among the top ones were uh, really interesting genes that, that could predict at baseline what's going to happen uh, after you vaccinated. So just to conclude, I would like to say that uh, uh, we are uh, drowning in a sea of data. There is a lot of data there. And, uh, and the thing is that there are not enough fishermen. The, if you put the, the boats randomly, you may not fish any nice uh, insights or, or hypotheses. And since vaccinology and bioinformatics cannot at all give you the fish, cannot at all tell you uh, here it is that the gene that you should validate. That's unfortunately not possible. There is no program that you press a button and give you this. We need the experts. We need the, the, the people that understand the, the biology and immunology to really, really help us looking at the data and, and find the, the nice insights. So the only thing that the bioinformatics can do is to try to reduce the, the region where you should put the boats, but it's still going to be a fishing expedition. And with that, I would like to, to thank uh, a lot of people that, that did the, this first part here, including my uh, previous mentor, Bali Pulendran, and also the, the people from my lab. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Helder. That was really interesting. Um, at this point, we can take any questions, so please just type them into the question box and I'll read them. And while we're waiting for everyone else to get questions typed in, I'm curious about your random forest approach. So do you think that the genes that you pulled out of there to predict adverse events are specific just to the Ebola vaccine or to a certain subset of vaccines? Like how broadly do you think that those can be applied? Well, that's a, a really good question, Dylan, because uh, we are now trying to do the same for uh, different vaccines. But the thing is that uh, the other vaccines are not as reactogenic as the, the, the Ebola vaccine. We do see some uh, inflammasome related genes common, uh, uh, in common to, to Ebola and also to, to some uh, live attenuated vaccines. But uh, Ebola vaccine is really uh, much more easier to find uh, predictors because it is a very clear output. But I think that once we increase the sample size, we may be able to find uh, more reliable baseline predictors for uh, flu vaccination, for example. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. It looks like there are no other questions. So thank you again. And um, like I said at the beginning, this talk will also be available on the Human Vaccines Project website later this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Nakaya. Thank you so much.